Now, like I said, there are certain instances. Uh, if the child comes to you a little later, we may do uh, a cat study to see if the left ventricle has the capacity to take the load when it is connected to the iota. And uh, we may even do CT scans if there is interruption of the aortic arch, there's co-optation of the aortic arch, hypoplasia. So these arch anomalies or any other associated anomalies which are better delineated on the CT scan, we may go and ask for the same. Now coming to management, the immediate management will include establishing safe oxygen level. So I'm not saying high oxygen level, it should be safe. Too less and too bad, both are not good, like you have understood by now. And you have to maintain a stable cardiac and pulmonary function. Cardiac output has to be maintained. So it's a delicate balance. You allow for mixing, but don't allow for too much that the lungs will get flooded. So you keep this going. So medically, what can you do? Medically, of course, you give a touch of oxygen if there is severe hypoxia. Start prostaglandin E1 infusion in case it's a duct-dependent lesion. If duct is the mixer alone and you think the ASD is too small, then open up the duct gingerly for enough mixing to happen. Whenever possible, do arterial blood gas analysis. Any metabolic acidosis, low calcium, all this can be corrected. It's not a permanent solution. It's not helping the child in any other way except to make him reach a center where definitive treatment can be given. If you have a setup where you can do switch as soon as the baby comes, then it's good. But sometimes babies come in a very, very uh, deteriorated state. They have acidosis of minus 18, 20, pH of maybe 7.29, 28, things like that. Then I think it's good that we do a balloon atrial septostomy. So you open the intraatrial septum so that mixing happens. It's just that it stabilizes the baby a little more before you put him on CPB. But once you do a balloon atrial septostomy, one must remember that child looks good, so don't send the child home without operating. Because I want you all to imagine this scenario. You make a big ASD, you open the balloon, you tear the intraatrial septum, now there's a big mixer. So whatever blood comes into the left atrium, has two choices now, whether to go into the left ventricle or to go into the RA. Generally, the pressure in RA will be lower than the LV. Blood tends to go into the RA. Then what happens, as it is, this left ventricle is pumping against a low pressure pulmonary artery. At least it was getting some work because of the volume of blood that was coming into the left ventricle. Now we remove that volume also, then the left ventricle will just regress in no time. You know, I've seen as early as six, seven days, it will regress. So don't discharge the baby and send him home. Rather treat the balloon atrial septostomy as a bridge to surgery. This slide will tell you all the types of surgical management for all types of TGA. But again, I'm repeating myself, we will stick to only simple TGA. So if it's only TGA, we have to do arterial switch operation, ideally between one to three weeks of life. One to two is also good. If there's a TGA with a VSD or a PDA, maybe very minimal pulmonary stenosis, which is not protecting the lungs, then we do the switch and repair of the defect. That's the VSD. Try to do it in one to two months. Try not to extend it beyond three months because we have seen severe uh, pH and even sort of onset of PVOD, even with four or five month old babies who come to us. And uh, we can't refuse, we operate on them, but they have a very stormy post-operative course. If there's a VSD along with severe pulmonary stenosis, right? So there is a VSD, so blood comes from the left atrium, goes to the left ventricle, across the VSD, into the right ventricle and goes to the iota. That's fine. but whatever blood comes back, it cannot reach the lung as easily because of the stenosis. So if you see the baby very small before 10 months or one year, then we do something called as BT shunt, which is a palliative procedure. Later on, we tunnel the VSD in such a way that we tunnel the LV to the aorta. 
So left ventricle blood across the VSD will go into the aorta. Now that makes the right ventricle blind now. So we place a conduit from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery beyond the stenosis. That is the RV to PA conduit. That procedure is called rastily. There are other things called REV and Nikaido. It will be a little too complex and deviating if I go into it. But suffice to know that these are all the options that we employ when we have to relieve this situation. There's another uh, very complex uh, subset where there's subiotic stenosis, where we do surgeries like DKS and rv to pa connection. So sending or atrial switch operation. So let us say the baby comes to you late in life and the left ventricle has regressed. So there are many options. Like we sometimes even take a chance and do it early if we think the left ventricle can be prepared. As I go on, I'll tell you how we have extracorporeal support like ECMO, which can help us to train the left ventricle on a pump. Or else we do something called as uh, two-staged, so two-staged switch. We don't do switch right away. We do something else for now, and then we might do a switch after some time. After some time can be anywhere between 45 minutes to few months. So ultra-rapid, two-stage, rapid two-stage, and delayed two-stage. So these are all the options that are there for switch. But if the center is not comfortable doing these things, or if we feel that you no, know, there is no option, this is not going to get better with switch, there is something called a sending or atrial switch operation. I just want you all to know about this. So take time to understand this picture. So from the body, it says on the left side top, you have SVC and IVC blood. Now it comes to the right atrium. Now what we do is we change the interatrial septum in such a way that we connect the SVC and IVC flow to go across the mitral valve. And where is the mitral valve connected? It is connected to the left ventricle. So follow all that is in blue. SVC, IVC blood will go into left atrium and it will go into the left ventricle and it will go into the pulmonary artery to the lungs. It will get purified and see it's written from lungs. You can see the pulmonary veins. They come to the left atrium. We take a baffle. Now see point number three, you are seeing the four veins. So we baffle that pulmonary, sorry, we baffle those pulmonary veins in such a way that it will flow over this one. That is point number one, SVC, IVC. So one baffle is below, okay? One baffle is, below. just imagine it like a flyover. So you are under the flyover, somebody is over the flyover. So what is under the flyover is SVC and IVC blood. It will go into the mitral valve, go into the LV, go into the pulmonary artery, get purified. Whatever blood comes back inside the heart, we create a baffle in such a way that it flows over this. That means now you imagine somebody is above the flyover, they're driving on the flyover. And that blood will come across the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, into the aorta. As you can see, aorta and pulmonary artery are where they are. We didn't do anything to it. Only thing is we change the flow of blood at the atrial level. That's why it's called atrial switch operation. It was devised by Senning, so it has his name. Senning's or atrial switch operation. All right. So this is an option which we can do. But then as you can imagine, this left ventricle will somehow function with time, uh, over time. But this right ventricle is not designed to function to push blood into the aorta. So what happens is right ventricle starts dilating over time. As it dilates, it will have tricuspid regurgitation. See this number four and the blood which goes back, that white tissue, that's the tricuspid valve. So it starts to regurgitate into the right atrium. 
So once it starts regurging, the baffle starts dilating. So once the right atrium starts dilating, then the rhythm starts getting bizarre. So there is sinus node dysfunction or atrial arrhythmias. 40 to 60% of the cases come back to us after a few years with these things. Or the baffle that you created. You know, technically, Senex is more difficult to do than switch, uh, technically. So you have to have a lot of 3D imagination when you baffle the uh, SVC and IVC as one baffle and over that, the other baffle. But despite the best of your efforts, you can have baffle obstruction and it can be 5 to 25 to 30%. Over time, after 25, 30 years, this right ventricle gets dysfunctional. So you can imagine as this right ventricle, that is number four, starts getting dysfunctional, the interventricular septum, the wall between four and two, it starts pushing itself into the left ventricle, right? So left ventricular outflow, even this PA flow also will get compromised over time. So we already spoke about tricuspid regurgitation and I told you about LVOTO, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. It's a dynamic obstruction, Nevertheless, it is an obstruction. You know, when we see some kids who come very late to us, unfortunately, and we see this problem in them. So let's say the kid reaches on time to you and you have decided now that you will do the arterial switch operation where you're going to switch both the arteries. So the important aspects before you take to theater is coronary anatomy because you need to know where it is and how it is because if it is single coronary or intramural, by intramural, maybe when I show the diagrams, I will show you what is intramural. So if these coronary anatomy are there, then it's very high risk. Uh, many years ago, like about 15 to 16 years ago, I have seen that surgeons used to say, this coronary anatomy is very complex, so we can't do arterial switch, let's do sending. But over time, over the last two decades, a lot of things have changed and a lot of improvement in techniques have happened. And today, coronary artery anatomy does not, I mean, or a bad coronary artery anatomy does not prevent a surgeon from attempting switch, but nevertheless, it does carry a high risk. For instance, if you have single coronary, the risk is three times. If you have an intramural coronary, that means the coronary artery travels the wall of the aorta before it comes out. That carries almost sixfold uh, risk to the baby when you're switching these. And next is the left ventricular function. Like I told you, it comes in time, it's good. But then even like first week of life, the left ventricle can regress. So time is just a number. So we should not relax thinking, oh, this baby is only one week old. So his left ventricle function will be good. I can do a switch easily. Nothing will happen. That's not a good thought to have. You thoroughly see how the left ventricular function is and be prepared for your intra and post-operative course. So let's come to the surgical part. Take some time to acclimatize yourself. AO is aorta. You can see that it is arising from the anteriorly placed right ventricle. And it is giving rise to the arch vessels and it comes down. So what is marked as X is the ductus. Then you have the right and left pulmonary arteries. SVC is superior vena cava. RA is right atrium. IVC is inferior vena cava. I think last class we spoke about cardiopulmonary bypass. So I think you will recall from that class that you are going to cannulate the aorta, SVC, IVC. But before that, there's a lot of dissection to be done. We need to dissect the pulmonary artery and aorta from each other. They generally have some tissue connecting each other. So both of them should be free of each other. We need to completely dissect the pulmonary, sorry, the patent ductus arteriosus and loop it. And this LPA and RPA, both these branches have to be dissected well into the hilum of the lung. Okay, once that is done, we decide where we have to cut the aorta that decision is made based on how high the coronary arteries are arising. I hope both all of you all are seeing both the coronary arteries. So there's a normal coronary pattern. Uh, to the above of the picture is the left coronary system and to the below of the picture, closer to the RA 
is the right coronary artery. So now we know where it is. You see it is entering into the aorta. So we need to see where it is and how much we need to cut those coronary artery buttons. So based on that, we will do a transaction of the aorta. You can see that the coronaries are anastomosed. The coronary buttons are anastomosed to the posteriorly placed MPA. So the dictum is the vessel which is posterior has to get the coronaries. So we take the coronary buttons. As you can see, coronary buttons are sutured into the main pulmonary artery. And anteriorly, you are seeing the aorta. Okay. And this is a completed picture where we have taken the aorta posteriorly and this pulmonary artery has been brought anteriorly and sutured to the pulmonary stump which was shown earlier. Um, this is so showing post, your first slide. Yeah. Uh, can you see something yes, different now? Okay. So this last slide where I've written reconstruction of RVOT, this is not the picture. It has to be the picture which I showed you in the end, where we connect the pulmonary artery anteriorly and iota goes posteriorly. Now, once this is done, we start to wean the baby off cardiopulmonary bypass. If we can comfortably do it, uh, if the left ventricle function is good, if the coronary anatomy has been taken care of in a good way, there is no kinking of the coronaries, there's no compromise of coronary blood flow, we should be able to wean off cardiopulmonary bypass. Once this is done, we secure hemostasis, that is we make sure there's no bleeding because there's extensive suture line involved here. And then following this, we do the chest closure. Sometimes we leave the chest open for us to do the chest closure on the following day or whenever the baby is ready for chest closure. So let us say the left ventricle function is not good. Then we go for what is called as ECMO, that is extracorporeal membrane oxygenator, which is a form of support to the heart and the lungs in the post-operative period. Whenever maybe we do a child who's presenting to us a little later in life, we support them on this machine for two, three, four days as much as it is required till the left ventricle gets trained to function against the systemic vascular resistance. Once it's completely trained, then we slowly wean the baby off this ECMO and start loading the heart to do the function. Once that is done, then we completely take the baby off ECMO. So it is good to have ECMO as an option whenever we are doing these sort of switches. Not necessarily when it is delayed. In other instances also, we might need ECMO. So it is something that uh, is good to have. So in the post-operative period, usually the coronary artery, if it is not placed well, you will see the effect 95 to 96% of the time on the table itself. You will see that there's blackening of the area which is supplied by that coronary artery. So you know that the ventricle is not adequately perfused. That's when we need to revise that coronary button. Sometimes you can see it in the post-operative period also, depending when there's pressure change. You know, these coronaries are so tiny in these babies. So even a millimeter matters, like how you put that coronary. So maybe at this particular pressure, it would be lying all right, but with higher pressure, it might kink, and then it might give you some problems. So coronary occlusion is one of the problems. Great vessel anastomosis, we would have got the pulmonary artery anteriorly, we would have taken the iota posteriorly, so we don't know when we reconstruct in the supravalvar area, we can create stenosis both at the pulmonary and aortic level. These are technical details which have to be taken care of while operating. Over time, or maybe even if there's a large shunt like a VSD, the pulmonary artery dilates. Now this pulmonary artery is the neo-aortic root, right? Because what was the pulmonary artery base now gets connected to the aorta. So this can be dilated. We see that a lot of time with VSDs. So that has the propensity to create some problems in the future like neo-aortic insufficiency, like 
neo ar aortic regurgitation generally it is trivial or mild and it can be managed with medications very rarely it will be severe arrhythmias are rare especially if the lv function is normal if there is no coronary artery obstruction and then like we already spoke there can be supravalvar ps or neo aortic regurgitation with permission i'd like i'm sharing some photos of some babies we operated here this baby came to us at day 6 of life he was a switch he came for switch with intact uh, ventricular septum and a small asd and this is a picture when he came to our opd last year when he was a 3 year old baby 3 year old child sorry so this is at 3 years uh this child came to us at 8 months of life and uh, luckily his lv was not too bad and we decided that we will do a direct arterial switch so generally like i told you it's good to do between 1 to 3 weeks of life but then at 8 months he was ready for switch we felt so of course there are a lot of precautions to be taken when we do something like this but then he came off well and he went home and on follow up this pictures on follow up uh, after one month of surgery and his left ventricular function was normal which means he had trained his ventricle to pump against the aortic pressure so finally children with simple transposition have demonstrated that it is possible to take a neonate with critical life threatening heart anomaly to the operating room shortly after birth and we can perform a major corrective open heart procedure with every expectation of an excellent outcome both in the short as well as in the longer term so the take home message should be arterial switch is doable uh, with very good results uh, in centers which are well versed to do these uh, complex surgeries uh, not just in the surgical aspect the cardiology the surgical team and the post operative intensive team if everybody is geared up with your perfusionist of course then this is a condition wherein the kids have a normal uh, post operative uh, life and barring a few post op complications that can happen in few kids they generally tend to lead normal lives so switches done in the early era of switch in our country uh, they are all now grown up uh, doctors engineers etc and uh, leading normal lives so a uh, switch is something that should be treated and one should not shy away from it thank you